stato a tutti che buono. Thank 
effective undercover officer and SWAT team. While in charge, the community intelligence team who led a team of officers to build a partnership between the community and the police department. The sheriff has been honored as um, numerous events and received over 150 awards. We'll be here until the end of the week and I missed all of them, but it includes the Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther King, the, the Junior Outstanding Service for the Community Award, Salute to Excellence, the Meritorious Police Duty, Lifetime Achievement Award, Community Service Award, and Citizen of the Year. And Sheriff Ruby holds the distinction of receiving appointments to board by two governors, Tim Kaine, appointed by Cheryl Woody to the Urban Policy Task Force in 2006 and 2010. Sheryl was invited by Governor Walker and Anthony McDonald to serve on the governing board of the Virginia Prisoner and Juvenile Reentry Council. Sheryl C.T. be 
being overheard. Someone has to sit here and go frame by frame by frame. So you think about it. 200 cameras times 15 minutes times two hours. I mean, 15 minutes times two hours. Very, very cost associated with that. And can we do it? So those are some of the things that we're looking for. Again, we're in the, the process now, doing the draft on that. Um, I had a conversation with the ACLU last, uh, last week at a forum, another forum, and we're talking about bringing them in. But I think it's important as we create and draft this policy that we have community input. And I think you answered the question number three before, which how long will be going to be stored? Will there be public access? And how will the, the community be well, again, most, and that's the thing, it depends on what state you're in and what law enforcement agents. I've seen somewhere that says the data is stored for a year, 90 days, six months. So we have not uh, identified that yet, but again, we want the community input. If it has no evidentiary value, it makes no sense because, again, we're paying for storage space. So automatically, after a certain number of days, it should be, you know, uh, uh, taken out of the system that we don't even have to use it uh, that, that day. So I think we will stop here for a few minutes, and if you have any other questions pertaining to the uh, pros and cons of these cameras, tackle would like to ask right now. Step up to the line and ask. Please state your name. That police department. That is not Richard. So let's go out. 
right quick, if I could take a few more. They had the evidence show that after, after the investigation happened out there in Ferguson, they brought, uh, as you all know, Obama appointed a commission, Department of Justice and FBI. They went and interviewed over 100 people and said, what you testify to the grand jury just doesn't add up to the evidence that we found. It didn't match up. One, there was DNA from uh, uh, Michael Brown on Officer Darren Wilson's shirt, his shoulder, his pants, and his firearm. When Officer Wilson discharged him, Michael Brown was inside of his vehicle. His body was inside. He was assaulting him. The gun discharge hit Michael Brown in the thumb. Michael Brown takes off. We all heard that everybody said his hands was up, he was shot in the back. There was no evidence to support that he had one gunshot wound in his back. There was no evidence to support that his hands were up. When they asked those hundred people who testified in the grand jury, did you see him get shot in the back? Why did you say that? There's no evidence to support your claim. They said, oh, that's what I heard on the news. That's what people were saying. That's what I saw on social media. That is wrong. Let me, let me finish. There was a gentleman outside doing work. He saw the whole thing. He never even came forward. It was still after the fact. I say that only to say, always let an investigation take its course. Please, folks, don't jump to conclusions. Because like you said with cameras, and you bring up the very point, that's why we have to have a clear, concise policy. Because at any time, you can turn on and turn off a camera at any point you want to get what you want to put on that video. So it's very important to let, let, let investigations take its course before we jump out there and say, police were wrong. But again, again, I have to say, and I gotta put this out there every time, opportunity that I get to tell my police department, your police department, we get it right here. I was just at Tuesday at University of Richmond, uh, former, uh, former uh, uh, Attorney General Edwin Meeks gave a presentation on Post Ferguson activities and makes on the uh, uh, investigation. And he said four things that police departments should be doing. One is engage in the community. Two, have let them have that say. And I tell you, everything that he said, we could have got up there and gave that same presentation. Because Richmond, we did it right. We've been doing it right since 2005 when we implemented community policing here. Since 2005, in 10 years, population going up, crime going down. Do we always get it right? No, I would be the first to say that. You know why? We're human beings just like everybody and everyone else. But it's my job as the leader of this department that when I see that, I believe in three things. They'll tell you, I believe in accountability, leads to credibility, I'm sorry, transparency, and transparency leads to credibility and legitimacy. The same thing you're asking for, sir, and I want you on that committee. All right. So, I mean, I, I, I mean uh, to, to address your point about Ferguson, there was also, for example, a person that was that had testified on the grand jury that was also a known liar and schizophrenic. Yeah. yeah, so 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 if you're I mean you're, you make you make some decent points, but the thing is let's be a fully objective with the facts. Now, you, like I said earlier, you you you, you just spoke about um a, a, you know, transparency and credibility. What does the civilian review board bring that to the discussion on the body camera? I think he I think he did say he's looking I'm looking into that. Yeah, I think he said that. Yeah. Okay. And then I just add very briefly um, uh, we're talking about Ferguson, we're going to talk about the places that all of this have happened. We are fortunate and blessed that it kind of happened uh, in the city of Richmond. But uh, you know what? That's that's incorrect. There's a person that came before city council not too long ago that complained about, that actually had credible complaints and complained in front of city council about him, about you know, police officers marching into his house, about harassing him, about handcuffing him behind his back when he had did nothing wrong. And y'all violated his constitutional rights. And sir, that investigation was completed and those allegations were sustained. Yes, they were. But what I was just trying to say is that what happened in Ferguson, we played the blame game, law enforcement, we played the blame game on the community. It was the community's fault because they let it be on and on and on. And nobody said anything about it. They never had meetings that we are having in there solution, facing the problem, they took the weapons, they took the, all of the tickets, they took anything the police said to them, and they let them got by with it, and finally had to come to fruition. The power is in the community. The police, RPD, Men Blue, they work in the community, but we are no stronger than the community. It is the community's fault, and yes, that's why it happened, it's all out of fruition. The report is right on time. I asked for 
prevention is with a pound cure, and that's what we are here tonight. But at the same time, I remember at the last, I remember at the very last community forum, there was this, there was this discussion about comply with the lane later. Why don't you think that that they have to, the people being complacent or be taking beatings or taking weapons? It's because of the people who are being infused with that compliant to play the later coach instead of being actively reactive to willing to stand up and, and, and assert their rights. I agree with that. Oh, well, thank you so much for, for your questions. I appreciate it. Do we have another question on this topic? Mm -hmm. Not one more possible. Who lives here? And I can walk. I can walk by and meet Miss Wise and say, "Hey, how you doing?" 
We are so in need of that and getting back to that, I assure you. When the officers get assigned to my sector, I have 30 officers and four sergeants. Uh, we, I have four brand new officers that just came out. I took them around on their first day and took them to houses, the historic Jackson Board Neighborhood Associate Committee members. They're going to the community meeting with me. I took them to businesses on Broad Street. These are young, impressionable officers, and I'll speak for myself, but I got to, hey, I'm a cop now, let's go look for the bad guy. No, we're getting back to the fact that let's go integrate ourselves into the community in which we believe. So we are desperately getting back to that, and I couldn't agree with you more. And the part about intervention, I went straight to lethal force. There's a whole use of force continuum prior to that moment, and it talks about presence and the ability to communicate and all the other different tools. Uh, but I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Just and, 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 thinking back off of what uh, Davenport has said, one of the first things that I did is again, you have to change. I call it old school. When I grew up, there was an officer, a, a footman, a white police officer, an all black neighborhood. And everybody respected him. My parents knew him, my grandparents, all the kids knew him. And Officer Robert Hill, the gas came, you better be on your best behavior. If not, you had to pay the pipe. But with that being said, I immediately, two foot beats per precinct. I was just telling Sheriff Woody, on Tuesday, we did a, 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 a community walk on the South Side Plaza. One of my officers, just talking about the businesses, a young officer, five year officer from Richmond, born and raised in Richmond. We went in, I went in about seven businesses. We had five groups we split up. And again, there were community members with us, right? That relationship. Every store that I went in, now he started his foot beat. I started it on uh, March 21st. His first day to work was Monday, walking his foot beat. So between Monday and two o'clock on, on Tuesday, when we started the walk, the seven to eight businesses that I went in, everybody knew his name. Every manager, shop owner, merchant knew this officer's name. And he was just excited. That's what it's all about. We have a younger generation of cops. C.T. Woody can probably tell me when he had to walk foot beats, right? Back in his time. Because I was a little baby when he started working. Right? <laughs> but anyway, today, you all see that you have police officers riding around cars with the windows rolled up and looking straight ahead, hoping nobody see it in certain instances, right? But this thing here is all of society. Younger officers that think about it, I'm getting officers 21, 22, straight out of college, never had a job, and giving them the power, or the state, or the city's giving them the power to take a life, to take somebody's freedom. Mm -hmm. So it's important that when you come upon us, the leadership of the department, to change that, that culture. It's a culture in the police department. I'm about boots on the ground, walking around. I'm out there, and I would tell my troops, I'm not going to have you anything, doing anything that I wouldn't do. So you bring up a valid point, sir, and we're working on that. But let me just say something before you answer. It's also a two-way street, so the community has to be involved as well. Yeah. You know, I come from Liberia, West Africa. In my, in my little community where we grew up, if you did something wrong, my neighbor would make sure I got a beat. Yeah. And then when my parents got home, I got a kid. Of course, now we're in a different time, but I'm, I'm saying, some of you don't know what I'm saying, right? It was that way in New York. Okay. Is there any chance of therapy instead of punishment? You know, helping people grow and change instead of punishing? I think CT, I think he can see But let me see how first. I think that's very important. It, 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 it starts at home, folks. Let's just keep, keep it real. It starts at home. Policing is one of the toughest, most complex, and, and complicated because one minute I can be on the scene of a theft and somebody has stole a tag off a car. Next assignment, I'm looking at a dead body in the street. But the thing is, I did the Christmas parade on Broad Street last year. I crossed over Melbourne in Davenport's area, and there were all African-American kids out there speaking to them. Hello, how you doing? Merry Christmas. Not one kid spoke back. Shame on those parents because if you're not speaking to me, the police, who are you going to run to when you're in trouble and need help? You're going to the wrong people. So, you know, it's, it's, everything is seemed to be thrusted on law enforcement today. What are you going to do about the problem? But what is society going to do about the problem? But CT, what are you doing some great things for those folks who have been in the system, but we still have to address those folks before they get in the system? You are 
100% right. We are locking up the wrong people. Yeah. Community. We are locking up people that are addicted on drugs, alcoholism, those that can't take care of their family, those that are not hardcore criminals, those that are sick, crack makes you get up in the morning and rob your mother, hurt your family, it tells you what time to go in the street, and all of that, that's a society problem. Teachers can't teach because they're trying to raise all the people's children. Babies have a baby. They go to the hospital, they have a baby, a crack baby is born, crack mother, they come out two or three months. Uh, social worker have a large, very large case, and not see them all. They own welfare, and next thing you know, crack babies have crack babies that have never been treated. It goes on and on. And we need to stop locking our young people up and start putting them where they need help, where we can stop putting bandages on the wound and start doing something about fixing the problem and stop playing the blame game. Who is missing the little the night that should be here? Our young woman. That's the thing. All of you all out here have been to the community. You know what it's all about the community. You used to be afraid of the police. Now you know that you're not afraid of them anymore. We need you. You need us. Even the bad guys call us when the bad guys are on them. We have to respond. We run in where everybody else run out. You know what I'm saying? All the time. But we are no stronger than what you are. I'm, you're very right. Accountability, responsibility. Chief Durham knows it. Everybody sitting at this table knows that the powers in the community, we are there to help you. And the most difficult time that I had in the minority community, as long as the many years that I've worked in it, was the fact that they will call you. But they don't want you to stop by their house. Don't knock on my door. I'll tell you this and I'll tell you that. But they put me in the West End. It was something new up there at Wilson Farm and everything else. They stayed, they waving you down, and they said, that's who he is right there, and I'm going to have you get it. And, say, and the reason why we're having such good times and better times and afternoon now, because the police department and all of you all are working together as a team to gather everybody achieves more. It is our problem. We need to face it. And when someone is committing crimes, I don't care who it is, my sister, my brother, whatever. And for whatever reason, you make it known. The criminals con control you by fear. They keep you by fear. The way you live, they tell you what they're going to do, and all of that. And they come down there to Richmond City Jail and learn each other's stories. And all they do is stitch and tell them each other all the time. Come to court, testify, and go back to the same jail, and nobody get hurt. So when you stand up, come out like you are now, you're concerned, you care, you want to work with the police, and definitely the police want to work with you. And the solution is, we got to wake our young kids up. They should be here, and they shouldn't be kicked to the curb when they mess up the school. But they should put, be put in a school where we have everything there for them. It might cost the community about maybe $10,000 a year. Come down to Richmond City Jail, you've got a job, you've been sick all your life, and you got to come down to the Richmond City Jail, and then be paying tax bills, $35,000 a year. Now we will help them with this problem, then you will resolve and then come back out with the same thing, and come right back in. So we are here, we are working with you, we are in this together, we got to be in it to win it, but we need to be proactive and stop being the actor. Uh, when you say that uh, your officers um, offer service across the United States are, are trained to, um, if they fear for their lives or possible injury, then it results, it can result in shooting, possibly killing. In all of the cases across the United States that take place, that's always been the answer. I fear for my life. 
so uh, as a result, many of our youth are dead. My question, going back to uh, Chief Durham, might cameras be able to override that? I, I, I don't have that name. I can't see. I, I'm just saying, do you, 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 see, do you, do you kind of see once that name is gotten? Well, no, because I can show you. You can go on YouTube. You just look at police video. You'll see with an officer with a camera, and folks are still shooting at him. Just last night, I had two officers fired. We don't come to work and get fired. I know in our job description, does it say, possibly to get shot and killed. But we know what we signed up for. But let me show you something. Oh, yeah, uh, this is my chief of staff. I want to do a, a visual presentation. When we talk about use of force, we have less lethal options also. So again, it's, we have what we call a use of force continuous. That is what you just said. First thing is just showing up on the scene. We would think that should be enough. The police is here. That don't work anymore in most cases, right? We know that. The second thing is verbal betrayal. Sir, man, I need you to put your hand behind your back. Most people should comply. If you comply, it's over with you. That doesn't happen. So we have all these tools on our way. I'm going to have to keep going back. <laughs> I, I completely 
completely understand being told my exact definition, completely understand. Like the chief said, there's a lot of things that happen typically prior to that point. And they typically deal with non-compliance. All the tools that we have are meant to do one thing, whether it's my pepper spray, my OC, or my ability to just talk to people. It's all to get compliance. And when those things go awry, other things happen. But I also want to mention, yes, a lot of things have happened in the country. But there's a lot of things taking place day to day on the Richmond Police Department that just aren't in the news or aren't taking place. Last summer, I was in charge of the Firearms Fusion Initiative. We seized over 130 illegal firearms on the city streets of Virginia. I haven't mentioned it, I've mentioned it some. There were three times where we came into some serious issues where deadly force may have been an option. We did not shoot anybody. We had an armed gentleman with a shotgun walking across the Martin MLK Bridge. And depending on how that situation went, luckily we had a state trooper that just tackled him, stuck up behind him. That option was not always there. You know, he didn't raise the shotgun off the ground. So a lot of those things happen. Um, and they're judged case by case. And like you said, it always comes down to, for me, I patrol the streets. Do I have an imminent fear that somebody is going to die, whether it's me or a citizen, or suffer serious bodily injury? And that's what it becomes an option. Okay, do you have a quick question? Oh, wait, one well, more. You said, why can't we just shoot him in the leg, right? Yeah. Um, well, Sergeant Moon will tell you he's a firearms instructor. I'm a firearms instructor. Um, sometimes it's hard enough just to get people to shoot 70%. Shoot your firearm and it's going to shoot straight with you, okay? This is a difficult task. I consider myself a very good uh, fire, firearms instructor, and I can shoot a gun well. Since the age of 18, I've been around firearms in the Army, so I'm very good. But during scenario based trainings, when we use simulation rounds, you know, it's one thing to shoot a big target and score 70%. But when we start doing realistic training, and we have, and they hurt too, by the way, so I really don't want to get hit by one. But when it adds some realism, uh, I just work through some force training. I'm missing. A statistic was given to me in training, and I haven't vetted this myself, but I'll share it with you. According to the FBI study, law enforcement officers get involved in, in, in shootings, and the distance is usually seven yards or less. Even with that said, the FBI says we miss 70% of the time. It is difficult enough to fire a handgun at a paper target. It is ramped up exponentially in real life circumstances. Shooting somebody in the leg, shooting the gun out of their hand. I can tell you from my own experience, it's strictly Hollywood. That's the only place that it applies. Maybe Sergeant Wood gets into the attack. Let me just say this too. Because sometimes your, your adrenaline is running and you, you have less than a split second to make a decision. Can you speak to that? Yes, no. Um, basically, like now, we're trying to try to compensate some of the thought process that you have to do with when you have to come into that situation. Um, that kind of people get to scenarios. But uh, yes, when you actually, when your adrenaline starts to pump through your veins, your decision making goes pinpoint. Okay. We might encounter you, a 
Okay? My career, people may be different than his career. My career, I might be like, he by my side, I think I can take him from here and And again, I, 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 I don't know, but I might start with who might approach you because he's smaller than I am and say, no, I better not go here and zone. I better use my base first because I don't want to allow him to leave grass me. I'm in trouble. That's the fear I'm talking about. So my fear, it may be different than his fear. And I you can't predict how one office is going to how that one is going to take on a situation compared to the other. That's, that's the fear I'm talking about. I'm not talking about citizen also fear. Okay. That's the difference that I'm trying to explain. That, that kind of explains the context. I appreciate the answer. All right, thank you. Uh, and this just briefly, how can the public has become involved in that? I, uh, I, I think we had relationships. Again, I've been here for Washington. And I come from Washington, D.C., 600,000 people. But the relationships here, I mean, it's, it's unprecedented. Faith-based leaders, the communities. We have uh, citizens academies. And that's how we attract folks into our fold. We teach folks about police, youth academy. We have a Hispanic academy going there. I don't think it gets any better than that. And I, I look at, you know, I was about, uh, Officer William Turner, January 2nd, he was shot, if you remember the That's a call that no police chief or any officer want to hear that one of their members have been shot. And the first question came to me because, again, I'm caught up in what society is talking about first in New York, right? Ohio. And I'm like, are people out there? You know what I mean? Is an officer or a right person? But what are the people out there? The people that came out came out to support Officer Turner. It doesn't get any better than that. And I think you get, you look at, and I can tell you, 10 years wasn't long ago when I first came here. Before I joined the department, I came to, you know, get the lay of the land of Richmond. We had Richmond police officers laying young black men in the mud, in the water, and it was totally unacceptable. Like, what are they doing here? I was never used to that. But you don't hear about that anymore. But I tell folks also, there has to be that trust factor, that relationship building, because one thing for sure, I, 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 we had a, a forum a couple of months, I mean, last in, in, in early February, and I tell folks, don't sit here and say police doing this and you can have a dollar complaint. I can't investigate anything if I don't know what's going on. So don't point fingers at us unless you bring me something to work with. So I think the relationships are here. We can always room for improvement to expand on the relationships that we have. But to still go out and this is what we're doing. We are in the communities. I've introduced myself. We have a whole new mindset now in my administration. And uh, officers' mentality is changing. We're walking foot beats. We're getting to know people. And we're doing everything I can. But the thing is, it's okay for you all to say hi to us also. Make us talk to you. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes we have to force yourself on us. We force ourselves on you all in certain instances. So we want to say it back in return. And the most important thing in the community is uh, building trust. That's what they mean. Um, we're about to be solving crime and all that kind of stuff. And I'm no hero. I have great support from the uh, police department and uh, other members of uh, the African American Homicide. And things of that nature. So when you get out there in the community, I can play basketball with the guys um, in my uniform. I could park my car and leave and run in the neighborhood and go inside the house in the community that I was working. And um, I could sit down and eat supper with those people. And over there, I found out that in the projects, what they call it again, I call it the community now. Some good people everywhere. Nobody bought my car. I came back out there, they let me sit down, I said, they let me sit there. It's building trust. And when people trust you, the police, when you work in that neighborhood and they know what you're saying, I've had my gun taken from me, I've been shot at, um, and robbers and all that kind of stuff. And I know I got off the SWAT team because I stopped being fearful. And the police officers stop acting a little longer down the road, and they think it's so bad because they good at what they do, and they think if anybody gets to, you're going to get hurt. And I realized that. And I learned from working with the community. I knew all the bad guys. I could talk to them. I knew what time the neighbors were going to work. I would pick them up from the bus stop that night and turn them home. You know, you got to, if you know the neighborhood, you work with the people out there, you know what you saw the crime, I know a few things. Hey, I saw the crime, but I never told them. You know, same way with the bad guys. They mad with their knees, and I used to tell them, I want to be tried. By 12, it'll be heard by 6. From down to a high. I'm going home to my family. And I used to be just as crazy as they were out there. And you demand respect. And 
they will respect you. But you got to get the community behind you. Richmond Police Department, yes, I was there for 35 years. We have grew tremendously. They work in the community. They work with the community. And I'm not saying because they're here. I was one of them that was out there. And the community made me. And the most powerful word in the community is unity. U N I T Y. You and all of us, we can make a difference. But we got to be willing to do just what we're doing now. Discuss it, bring the problem to us, come up with a solution. We got your back, and you all definitely got to help with those problems. All right, this next, uh, did you have a question for me? Yeah. Uh, okay. Just, uh, back to what is the expectation for someone being accosted or taken down? I mean, body slam, chokehold, you know, um, I'm just, they just come to mind. Um, but what can we say to someone who uh, maybe you know, maybe getting ready to do something criminal, oh no, don't do that because you know the cops are going to get you and, and you may get put in a chokehold or, you know, what, what can you say, what can you tell, even you know, about what might happen if they are um, stopped by the police or if they've done something wrong. One of the things, and that's a good question, uh, one of the things as it relates to the youth, and I want somebody else to speak on this too, but my vision is, is you know, uh, they had the, the uh, just the opening of Huguenot High School right after the holiday, and I, I was there, and I had one of those, I always had these what I call aha ah moments. I don't know where they gonna come, but I had a moment. Well, anyway, I'm sitting here, and one of the things, you know, I'm talking about is youth engagement. And it hit me. I'm in a order to, I mean, I'm sorry, a gymnasium, and over a thousand kids. And I'm like, I have the way I do that. They'll bring you already in the schools. So I, I went to my captain and said, hey, let's put together a program where right now we're looking to uh, do assemblies before school out, school gets out. What, what, am I, what do we expect from you? What do you expect from us? But also in that teaching them when you encounter a police officer, this is how you should conduct yourself. And I will tell you this, I've been doing this business for 27 years. When I have it, had to engage in you, back when I was a young officer, when it's six or seven of them, all of them got power, they choose to, they want to challenge you. But when you get that one individual juvenile by himself, they the nicest kids, yes sir officer. So it's that influence, you know what I mean? That peer pressure is what's driving our youth. But again, I can't, it, it, it stated enough, is that it has to start in the homes. One of the things that I'm doing with the elementary schools, I'm having all of my officers and my command is well, even civilians, adopt the elementary school. You gotta start somewhere. You can think about this. And that came off of when I those young kids didn't speak to me. Well, I'm gonna force you to take me to your home. Because when Chief Durian goes up over over me, over me Shepherd Elementary School, starting next month, that's my school that I adopted. They're gonna know Chief Durian. They wanna go home and say, guess who was in my class today? Chief Durian. The household will know who Chief Durian is. Because that's important. If we can start there and change in their mindsets. But to answer your question, if you have kids, just tell them to comply. They are not going to win that battle with the police in the street. They are not. You know when they say comply, they complain. Because you're not going to win that fight. You're not going to win that fight. And I would say this, and I have to give kudos to one of our sergeants, Sergeant Ray Fitz. He's done a couple of youth forms already at our training academy. His, uh, his fraternity and Vegas side of the box a couple of youth forms. And We've had quite a few years attend that, attend that form. And he does a great job of just explaining just that what you ask, what should you do when they encounter the police. He goes over what you do on a traffic stop. What are we looking for? You know, we don't like movement when you stop a car. We don't like people moving around in a car because we don't know you. The airport just told you, we recovered 130 bombs. And, and most, of them, most of those are going to recover the deal with stops. So we don't know what you're doing. So we, we always tell people, put your hands on the steering wheel, we can see your hands. What's going to hurt the officer? Somebody's hands. I'm not worried about anything, but being able to see somebody's hands. So those type of things are, are what we try to impart on our youth. What they should do, and like, like Chief Grant would say, the biggest thing he got, out, he, he got out of that was comply. Because again, you're not going to win that battle. Just comply. If something happens and after that, then you can just comply. Like you said, make a complaint. We'll take that complaint and we'll make sure we investigate to the police. All right, we'll, we'll move on to the next. We talked a lot, we talked about jail, jail alternatives, and we, we won't go there, but I will ask this question. How can faith-based programs be of assistance? 
faith-based programs are very, very important. Very, very important. Uh, Chief Durham has already uh, uh, had a meeting with uh, my faith-based organization. He's going to work uh, with them inside of the jail as well as outside of the jail. And that's what we have. I have over 88 uh, faith-based uh, people that come into Richmond. Uh, see the justice center there every day. Whatever the faith feels, we have someone there. And uh, they're volunteers, they're communicating with our folks, and all we are requiring them to do is that they, they get out, have the church doors open, and uh, arm with them and continue working with them. They are very, very important. I mean, uh, it's a hard thing uh, to really say. You know, you can have. Bibles in jail, but you can't bring Bibles into the school. You can get plenty of Bibles. All the Bibles in the world, they bring scriptures and everything else there. And uh, you know, hey, that's after you get there. We want to do these things that will keep them from getting there. So the faith-based organization is very important. Our Chief Norman is up on top of that. He's up on top of the communities. He's up on top of the new way. Work smarter, work harder, all of that. But you know what? Doing your job at home, doing your job in the community, working with our youth, they're not as bad as they see themselves to be. You know, they, they call family anybody that they can keep and do things to them and say, now we love you because all they've been seeing all their life is mama being abused in Richmond City Jail. The average age is 18 to 35. Most of them don't know who their fathers are. They don't have a GED or education dropped out of school. And hey, nobody cares about me and I want to live from one day at a time. I'm not looking for the future. I want mine to land. Don't mind dying and don't care about anybody or nothing. And we have to change that. We have to change that. And it starts in the home. And when it starts there, and we start working there with them and letting them know the police, Lord knows, every organization got a bad apple. And they always get eliminated. But our job is to protect and serve. Your job is to see that we do what we're supposed to do. And if you're working the news with their us, we got you. You got us. You are the power of the community, not us. We are there to serve you. You know, that was the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's really the, the, the RPD. I, I'm telling you, it's just an awesome relationship with our faith leaders. One of the things I had a prayer breakfast uh, early in the month, and we had over 100 pastors and faith uh, folks in attendance. And one of the things every year is to give the charge where are we going as a, as a group, as a partnership. And one of the things that I'm looking to do is, is to have a 100 day safety, a uh, summer of safety. Uh, that's my vision. Um, what I'm looking to do is uh, in the month of May to uh, work with probation and parole, identify those folks in those areas. I'm identifying two areas. Uh, that we're going to focus our attention on. You can predict crime, you can prevent crime. Uh, with that being said, I asked them, you know, it's always, the department was always, from my understanding, the department was always telling, it, you know, the ministers and the churches, hey, this is what we want you to do. But you have more resources than we have. <laughs> you know what I mean? So don't tell us what you have to support us. So uh, we have, we're working in the four precincts, the captains are responsible, they've been meeting with the groups and come at the beginning of uh, um, summer, all the way up to August 31st. Every weekend, we're gonna be going in the communities as a faith-based group, uh, the faith-based leaders, city services, which has been sort of a disconnect. I'm uh, bringing city service, I meet with the leadership in the city, and uh, we're gonna work together as a team. I, I, I think sometimes if people work in silos, people are doing great things all across the city, but the right hand don't know what the left hand is doing. And some are duplicating services, and, and people just don't know. So somebody has to be that bridge, you know, to bring all this together. And I guess that's why I was born here, and I'm trying to do that. But I think it's very important, again, as it's been stated all evening, I need you. If you're looking for me to do this thing by myself or my people, we're going to fail. I'm going to tell you that you would never be satisfied. But if I could come in and say, I know Ms. Jones, Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith, Ms. Jackson, they're on my team, so much we can accomplish. I think you answered two questions in one because one of the questions was, what is your vision of community policing? policing? And the other one was, how can the community assist law enforcement with human trafficking, homicide investigations, and cold cases? So that's the, the last couple of questions. So maybe we can just sum it up. Each one can speak on. I want to do that. Okay. 
don't know how to, to act up, you don't come home at night. You stay there, and when you get a ticket, we're going to try to do it. Act up with not be coming down that way out of here. Treat the problem and stop putting bad angles on the floor. If not, you will have that service. All they're doing is taking it. You don't tax pay the money. This correctional system in jail is big money. Old people that visit the you know, city justice center, and I sign off on the $25,000 and $30,000. Every month, the people don't want to pay the rent, don't want to pay anything else, because they're going to come down and say, well, I'll tell you, that's in jail, and get canteen, and get extra stuff that they really want. And that's the same. It's big money, private investment. Build a school. Eliminate the jail. Put the place for the bad people, but continue. That's what I'm doing down there. What we are trying to do is to make better citizens instead of smaller problems. You also need to attack the parents of some of them. That is correct. Because it's it's parenting one on one. Yes, that is correct. Prior skills. Well, how do you do that though? How do you well, how do you do that? You let them know how important they are, that they are love, the family is the most important one in their life. Um, we teach them um, uh, their parenting skills, fatherhood skills, motherhood skills. They get GEDs inside of there, uh, Virginia Union is there, teaching power courses, UVA, VCU, uh, giving scholarships for them to go to school and all of that. That should be done up front. You know, already there. When they come out, what you going to do there? Are you going to give them a job? Or are you going to make them come right back and, you know, so hey, it starts that way. Yeah. Um, I want to say thank you to this panel, first of all, and uh, I really appreciate you being here. I'm not from here, so maybe my question might be a little bit off. You're talking about who's missing in the audience, and that's young people. Uh, I'm looking at this panel and thinking somebody's missing up there, too. Um, I haven't seen many, as many uh, officers of color as I have people who are European descent wearing uniforms. And it seems to me uh, almost all the media stuff is about their bad attitudes. And I'm wondering how. That is being addressed in this city since it seems to be much better than like or some other New York or some other places. Um, how are these officers of European descent being helped to overcome their fears of anything black? Something 12 doesn't look like it's 18. And a bullet to the head is not, to me, it can't be standard for this, you know, uh, actions. Um, I, I know you may not shoot a gun out of your hand from the middle of the leg, but the middle of the body is bigger than the head. So it seems to me that there is a piece missing that the uh, racial piece that doesn't want to get talked about and we're doing nowhere else has to be real. That some people of your business that fear black folk, no matter what their size or age, or whether they got a gun or a toy, it just don't matter. They know the fear and they should kill, bullet to the head, end of story. What is being done to help officers of your business get over their fear and treat people with respect and like they expect something better than a bullet coming in there, when there is no weapon. It does. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a very important question. When I was announced on February 2nd, that was the very, probably one of the very first questions that was asked about diversity in the department. And I was telling you, when I came on board, I was a deputy chief, I came on board uh, in November, and one of my duties was responsible for was human resources looking at higher hiring practices and, and the racial diversity made up of the department. And I was really taken aback. We have a 50% um, black population here in the city, but I only have about 38, 39% African American on police department. But, but, but that's okay, and I say this because in the 80s, 90s, they weren't hiring African Americans on the department at a very small number. So I tell them, I can start working on that. I would never catch up. I can tell you that now. Let's not, for the next 10 classes, I have all African Americans, and that's not happening. I can tell you that now. But as, as it relates to the training piece, I would say the partnerships, well, here we're talking about partnerships, but I'm talking about on the law enforcement level. I mean, Henrico County, P, uh, Henrico County, Chesterfield County, Hanover County, and Harvey, we have a great working relationship. With that being said, prior to my coming here, and even before uh, Ferguson, they were talking about doing bias related training. Uh, I, uh, Yes, and, and that, that was in the works. Probably my second week here, I, the management team from both Henrico and RPD was sitting in the training session for a day and a half. 
And I tell you, I learned so much here because we all have influence by I don't care who you are, you hate somebody for some reason. And, 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 and it, was, it, it was a great course, and being one of the top leading uh, uh, professionals in academia teaching that course from Florida. With that being said, once we got the training, the next uh, we we had to train the trainers from both in Rifle County and RPD. I would tell you, probably should be next week, we would be wrapping up where every member of the department has gone to that training. We also had when the recruits come in, they have uh, cultural training, right? Diversity training. And we bring people in. But not only with that, the instructors from throughout the department, and this is an awesome team, these women, women, men and women volunteer their time to come over and teach the new recruits. Recruits in the academy six months. But guess what? I have a Chinese and a Korean sitting at the same table. Can you believe that? <laughs>
That's what I'm saying. If we can engage in youth, I want to see young men and women from the city of Richmond or Mary Police Department. That is my Amen.
and all the way, they still be modern, and like I say, they are not violent, they are non violent, and they are most of all misdemeanors that have just been charged with crimes that have been violated. But the laws need to be changed too. Yes, that's, that is correct. <coughs> So what should we do? We need to, I guess, be uh, either writing or calling our congressmen and women. That is correct. Yes, ma'am. Um, first, I wanted to really say I live in the United States. I put him on my hands.
regard to the um, fire department. And we actually take the good step. Obviously, hindsight is better than foresight. So we take situations and we put our options through it. So if they, and we come up with options. And a lot of options might be uh, either less lethal or lethal, whatever way it dictates where the scenario puts it to us. We give them options so they, they can make better decisions. This question could be answered, um, and I would like to see the audience answer, if you know, along with the panelists that come in mind. Uh, um, what do you, you talked about, you know, different forms of incarceration, yeah. which, which, which in, in some instances I support, but what I, my personal belief is that what, when you have corporations like the GEO, like the corporations, um, the, the corporations, the Correctional Corporation of America, you know, constantly lobbying state legislatures to change the laws to make certain things that were once legal illegal. You know, it, 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 it kind of perpetuates that, um, you know, the rise of crime. So my, my, my question, and this is for the audience, is this. Would y'all be willing to lobby the legislatures to have them change the laws so that certain, you know, certain crimes, like marijuana possession, are to criminalize? Instead of instead of having a five, fifteen year penalty. Well, I never said he said that we need to to call, write, email, uh, bother our Congress women and men for them to to make, change some of these laws. But then also you can talk about it because it, it has to be a law. Right? I, I would tell you that conversation has came up. It's come up. Excuse me, I'm sorry. It's come up in this year's legislative session. So it's already being talked about. Well, um. And, 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 and to, get to, to get to the point about writing a congressperson, personally, given how, for example, how the state, how the state legislatures were being lobbied by the major power to have their records sealed you know, from, from public scrutiny for the next five to seven years, I don't think writing a congressperson would help. So I would suggest to everyone, perhaps it's time that, and, and that's plenty of us in here, I'm under, and for, when, for the record, I'm under 30, so I'm one of the young ones here. I would suggest everybody also try to run the office so we can throw these people out and then change them all ourselves. Middle School. And 
that one, the first one was for folks to bring in concerns and issues based on Ferguson and those types. This one is, we're going to have representatives from every unit in the police department, internal affairs, the leadership, the precinct command, the training division, where folks can ask questions to us about, again, how do you do your job? I can't, I can't, I can't impress upon you enough. We have so many programs a Citizens Academy, we have neighborhood assistance officers, people from the community come and work with us every day, drive around put on a uniform and drive around in the car. I don't think, I mean, we're out there. We, yes, <laughs> yes, and I, I would encourage everybody in here, attend one of the cities of the Citizens Academy, especially, what's your name, sir? Montague. Montague, especially you, please sign up for one of them, and you'll have a different perspective on what we do. It's easy to sit back again, you know, somebody talk about what you, Early English, what you see on TV, that's not reality. And guess what? Next week, they come back for another episode. It don't happen like that in real life, ladies and gentlemen. So it's important that you go there. Again, tonight, I just got word uh, that they're having a, uh, 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 another rally up at uh, VCU students. Again, Black Lives Matter. Well, let me tell you something. As your chief of police, every life matters to me. So to go out there, and I respect them. You know, we, we try to accommodate them. But, you know, it comes a point for me personally, I take it personal. I have a passion for law enforcement. My brother was murdered in 2005. I had just got to Richmond, and to get the call, many see 20, but at that time, 18 years, being on the scene of homicide, seeing folks behind that yellow tape when he was talking about that police line, how they would react. Well, it hit me, and I made a commitment to myself and, and, and the people that I've ever worked with, this was in DC at the time, that I thought, if I could touch a young life, if I could stop somebody from pulling the tree, if I could put people in place to prevent crime, I'm going to do that. I mean, not stop somebody from pulling that trigger, but I know in my heart I did my best. If you want to get 110% from me, you got to just ask these guys. They see how I work. But the thing is, is that we need your help. You sit here, talk to the young kids, bring them out to these homes. We are everywhere. Yesterday, I was at the first precinct, uh, first precinct impact meeting. Last week, times this past week before that, at a community meeting at the church. I'm everywhere. But what I'm tired of hearing, folks, and I mean this, this is not Ferguson. Give us credit for the things we have done. If the police, your police officers have done something wrong, bring it to our attention. Because you got my word. If you have violated, violated folks' rights, mistreated folks, over, overzealous and using use of force, they're going to have to answer to me. And I don't want to on your police department. I'm telling you that now. So we're out there. Go to the website. Joel comments to some of the sessions we have. Youth engagement. We have a young adult police commission, high school students. Very talented coming. They work with us. The Power Program. Let me tell you something. Last December, and I had just got here, they had a Christmas celebration for these young men and women. You talk to us about young talent. All the kids in Richmond are not bad. Let me tell you that. You had some talented kids, bands, boxers, lacrosse, soccer, football. I mean, they just do it all. Just an amazing group of young kids. But those are the ones, they're okay. How do we reach the ones who have those issues against us? don't like us for whatever reason. Tell me why you don't like me. I did this scenario. We did a walk in um, Randolph. I'm young and very good learning. In Randolph last month, and walking around, I encountered a man had a flyer talking about the devil models and everything. I said, if you do anything, help us out. I'm not having to speak my life. I'm not having to do a damn thing. Why are you saying that, sir? My brother was murdered 10, 15 years ago. He had just got out of jail. He has a bitterness for police. But, sir, I didn't do anything to you. You just won. But it comes with the territory. I have to suck it up, keep moving. But as long as I can keep being out there reaching people, somebody out there, and I tell my officers, every kid on a bicycle in Yuri Corps, the bicycle is not stolen. So keep that in town. You know what, what, what bothers me is that you're passionate about it. You're passionate, but I think we need to also be passionate about when we kill each other. Yes. Not just having yes. someone like Thank you. you. Thank you. We're passionate about killing each other. You know, I don't see that at all. I don't hear people talking about it. It's just another black person that's killed another black person. We don't, we, we don't riot. We don't like it. It bothers me. It really does. And I think that's something that we need to tackle as well. Yes. But in order for us to first do that, we have to first stop treating black on black crime as if it's an anomaly. That's why you see the statistics saying, for example, that 84% of white people killed are killed by the white people. It's not, it's not, it's not just. from killing one another is what I'm saying. Oh, true. But like I said, we can't. Forget the statistics. We're talking about killing one another. Why don't we tackle that as well? We're not doing that. Well, we, 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 we want to. By making excuses, it 
it doesn't change anything. Well, we try, but the thing is, it's already happening. And that's not an excuse. That's already you're happening. Right, whenever you say that, whenever I, and I'm from Africa, whenever I say that, I hear people say, well, but, you know, but, 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 what about treating each other with respect? And when we do kill one another, go right. Do something that means that you respect each other's lives. Or how... Or how, how about we change the system that actually perpetuates this in the first place? Yeah, I just want to clarify one thing. When we talked about use of force incident, the young lady just asked that question. Um, my attorney just said that. So we have incidents and then we have complaints. Complaints are investigated by our internal affairs, and then there are reasons they go over to the Commonwealth Attorney's Office for review for, for criminal charges. So I just want to make sure it's just not an internal review board for uh, the egregious critical, I'm sorry, complaints against you.
pastor for bringing that to us, social action. Uh, AME Church is huge on that. I'll call a couple of names, you probably know them. Uh, but anyhow, um, we want to thank him for bringing social action to 3rd Street. And when we get into our meetings, it's so much going on until it's just a natural fit of what takes place next. And when we're discussing having this, we just looked over at Dr. Yerby and we said, Dennis, would you take this one on? Can we give him a round of applause? He didn't let it go because the snow came and left. He came back and left. But I think today was what it was supposed to be. Yes. Okay, 